The next speaker is uh, Dr. Jonathan Francis. He's uh, our anesthetist now who does most of the minimum-invasive subjectomy work. He's uh, at, at the Norfolk Norwich University Hospital. He's also a graduate from University of Sheffield. In 2000, he started his anesthetic training and took up consultant posts in Norwich in 2013. His training started uh, in, in Sheffield, Cambridge, Melbourne, Australia, and then Norwich. His main uh, areas of special interest are upper GI in anest uh, surgery, anesthesia, thoracic surgery, and obstetric surgery. So he is very, very good at uh, epidural and multimodal analgesia. Uh, we, we never have to do an epidural gram for him uh, when he's putting in an epidural. Um, his keen interest is in teaching and lectures at the University of East Anglia, uh, especially on the subject of perioperative care or for high-risk surgical patients. Over to you, uh, Dr. Francis. Thank you so much for your kind help. Thank you very much for um, asking me to talk, Ed, and for that very kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm very happy to be talking to you all. Now, um, I've been asked to talk about multimodal analgesia uh, for patients who are having minimally invasive esophagectomies. Um, so that's what I'm going to do and try and put it in the context of an enhanced recovery program, which we've heard a lot about already. Now, as you can, uh, as we've sort of spoken about already, enhanced recovery really is becoming an accepted and almost really expected pathway of care after major surgery um, for all different kinds of, of, uh, of surgeries. Um, and it's been well demonstrated across various specialties to, to lead to reductions in hospital length of stay uh, and reduce morbidity for patients. And as we've heard already, you know, it's really a multifaceted approach of preoperative preparation, intraoperative care and post-op care um, to, uh, to help in, in improve and, uh, and, and enhance people's perioperative experience and their recovery. And we know, and we heard earlier, how important early mobilization and early feeding is. Now, you're not going to be able to mobilize a patient early unless they're comfortable because pain is just going to stop them from moving. So we need to think about how we're going to provide that pain in a way that makes them comfortable, but also enables them to, to move and, and mobilize. And multimodal analgesia um, is a good approach. So what multimodal analgesia really means is, um, you know, we use different painkilling drugs of different classes that work sort of pharmacologically in different ways. And you combine those, those different uh, drugs in sort of lower doses than you otherwise would do if you were using them individually. And you find that with lower doses of these drugs mixed together or combined together, you can, you can achieve good results with pain, uh, pain management. Um, and also it's important to stress that we use regional techniques. So lots of local anesthetic to try and block nerves and, uh, and, and numb the operative site to, uh, to improve pain management. And really what you're trying to do is reduce the amount of opiate that you're gonna to need to use. Because whilst opiates, are, opiates have been the sort of the mainstay of post-operative analgesia for years and years and years now, and they are good painkillers, but we all know that they have lots of side effects, itching, nausea, sedation, ileus. So anything you can do to reduce the amount of opiate that you um, that you use is going to be beneficial. So what are the aims of analgesia? I mean, it seems a bit simplistic, really, but I think it's important to think about it. So we want our patients to be comfortable. And why do we want them to be comfortable? Well, A, because it's not very nice to be in pain. But B, we want them to be able to take the deep breaths that we've heard about earlier. We want them to be able to cough any secretions up out of their lungs particularly patients having esophagectomies or thoracic surgery, and we want them to be able to mobilize. And they're not gonna do that if they're in pain. We want to minimize the side effects of our analgesia. As I've already mentioned before, opiates have lots of side effects. So we want to reduce those side effects as much as we can. There are also other side effects like hypotension that epidural, for example, can cause. And also we want the pain relief techniques that we use to be user friendly. We want the nurses to be able to manage them, you know, relatively easily on the ward. And we want it to be acceptable to the patient. 
And if we get it wrong, so if the analgesia is not adequate, what are the potential problems and consequences for the patient? Well, they're going to be in pain. Pain's going to stimulate a sympathetic sort of response, increased catecholamine um, circulation in the circulation, which is going to make a patient tachycardic, hypertensive, increase the cardiac stress. And these patients having esophagectomies and, and these sorts of surgeries are the elderly patients, the comorbid patients. And if you stress their heart too much with these surgeries, you may precipitate a cardiac event like uh, you know, ischemic heart disease, MIs, or, um, or precipitate a stroke. If it hurts to move and it hurts to breathe, the patient's not gonna breathe well. They're not gonna be able to deep breathe and expand their lungs. They're not gonna be able to cough and, uh, and cough up their, um, their secretions from their chest and they're gonna get chest infections. They're also gonna be slower to mobilize. They're gonna have a general slower recovery. And so really, you know, analgesia is vital for any kind of enhanced recovery process. And another thing to consider is that we know that if acute pain is not managed well, then the proportion of patients may well go on to develop chronic pain um, conditions. So what are our analgesic options? Well, we've got a whole list of drugs that we can give um, systemically on the left of the slide. Uh, opiates, paracetamol, simple drugs, paracetamol, anti-inflammatories, uh, NMDA antagonists, so ketamine can be very useful in low doses, gabapentinoids, magnesium is very helpful. And we can give carefully um, systemic local anesthetic infusions, which has been shown to be beneficial in certainly colorectal surgery. And then there are the regional techniques that I've mentioned or you've heard a bit about already. So spinals, intrathecal drugs, epidurals, paravertebrals, intercostal nerve blocks. And then slightly more recent developments are fascial plane blocks, which I'll mention briefly later on in my talk. And then even simple things like infiltrating local anesthetic into the wound all has its place and plays its part in, uh, in the sort of multimodal approach to, to post-operative pain. I'm just going to pass these slides because my uh, circles have moved. Okay, so a quick talk about epidurals or a quick mention about epidural analgesia. For a long time now, epidurals have been considered the sort of gold standard for, um, for pain relief for, for following major surgery. And there's no doubt that actually a good working epidural provides outstanding, fantastic analgesia bilaterally um, without the need for giving really any systemic opiates. Um, they can be continued for several days. So there's all sorts of advantages to epidurals and, and they do work well if you're looking purely at how good the uh, pain relief they, uh, they provide. But they're not perfect. You know, they have a failure rate. Um, as was demonstrated earlier, it can be quite difficult to actually get the epidural catheter into the right place which means it's not gonna work properly. Even if you get it into the right place, it may well move or migrate during the time it's in there. Sometimes the epidural can be disconnected from the infusion and then it stops working, obviously. It requires a fair amount of nursing input to monitor the patients and care for the patients with epidurals, which requires training, updating, um, and takes quite a lot of the nursing staff's skill and time. And as we've heard a bit about earlier, epidurals can contribute to post-operative hypotension. And whilst this can be managed, um, one of the issues we find on the wards in the UK is that often hypotension, well, the only real thing that the, the, the junior doctors can do is give the patient fluid. And they treat the hypotension with fluid because they think that they're hypovolemic. And then if they're not careful, it's very easy to fluid overload the patient, and make them edematous, peripheral edema, pulmonary edema, edema at anastomotic sites, um, which can all cause problems. So whilst epidurals are good, they're not perfect. More recently, um, there's been a big switch, certainly in thoracics, and now with our enhanced recovery program um, for esophagectomies to paravertebral analgesia. As you've heard already, this is where we put a um, a catheter, the same catheter as you would use in an epidural, into the paravertebral space, which just sort of sits alongside the vertebra, um, superficial to the pleura. 
and we deposit and infuse a fairly high volume of local anesthetic into that space and it spreads up and down um, the space and bathes the, um, the nerves as they come round to the chest wall and certainly provides excellent sort of unilateral chest wall analgesia. And here you can just about see on the slide there, the tip of an epidural catheter just beneath the pleura. This is probably a little bit lateral. It probably would be better slightly down there. But even so, if you infuse anesthetic through that catheter, it will spread down here to, towards the nerve roots and should work really effectively. So there's lots of evidence, mainly from thoracic surgery, um, about how effective paravertebral catheters are compared to epidurals. Um, so there's sort of a good evidence base for them. Um, they have fewer side effects than epidurals and certainly shouldn't cause anything like the degree of hypotension. And they're very well tolerated by patients. And these days really it's, it's the analgesia of choice, um, certainly in the UK for both, for both VATS, thoracic operations using a thoracoscope and for thoracotomy often used in conjunction with intercostal nerve blocks and um, a PCA, IV PCA opiate. And these are just a few of the articles. There's loads of them you can find. And there's a good Cochrane review in the UK from 2016, again, showing how, um, how effective paravertebral is compared to, um, to epidurals. Now, there isn't a great deal of evidence yet for esophagectomies and, and which is better in terms of uh, for patients in terms of epidurals versus paravertebral but there is a PEPMEN trial underway uh, in the Netherlands which is a multi-center randomized controlled trial looking specifically at paravertebrals versus epidurals for esophagectomy patients so we'll wait and see the results of that trial but I suspect it will show that paravertebrals uh, are just as good if not better than epidurals. So intrathecal morphine is important as a part of or component of our program. Again, it's very established in abdominal surgery for colorectal operations to have intrathecal morphine, where we inject a really tiny dose of morphine into the CSF. So no systemic absorption, and it provides about 18 to 24 hours of analgesia. So it's good, effective analgesia, and it reduces the systemic requirements for opiates. There's a slight risk of delayed respiratory depression, um, but really in practice, you don't see it too often. Well, you don't see it often at all, in fact. So I think it's really just a minor concern, but it's always something to bear in the back of your mind. When we're using them for the esophagectomy patients, we just purely put in morphine and saline. We don't put any local anesthetic into the spinal because we don't want to cause a sympathetic block with spinal local anesthetics. And, uh, and, and cause hypotension. Now, just a quick mention of fascial plane blocks of the chest wall. So in the last, I don't know, several years, more and more blocks have been described by various anaesthetists around the world where they found fascial planes between muscle layers in the chest wall and have injected local anesthetic into them. And they've all provided um, reasonable analgesia for, for the chest. Probably, sorry, my uh, circle has moved on the slide, but the erector spiny at the top, it's probably the one that's most useful for, um, for thoracic surgery. Um, and that certainly we use from time to time in our hospital, particularly for rib fracture management and find it very helpful. But it may be that over time that becomes an established um, and regularly used method for, for providing pain relief for patients having thoracic surgery or chest surgery. And if any of you are interested, this is a good article from Anesthesia earlier this year that sort of describes all the various fascial plane blocks that, that you may see used. So what do we do for our patients in Norwich who are having the, um, the minimally invasive esophagectomies? So in theatre, we run a remifentanil infusion. We give them paracetamol and then some fentanyl or morphine towards the end of the surgery. We normally give them a reasonable dose of magnesium around about five grams usually. And we give them some intrathecal morphine at the halfway point as we're repositioning the patient in the lateral position for the second stage. For post-op, 
we use a, par a paravertebral catheter, which is placed by the surgeons sort of directly under vision from within the chest. And we infuse rapivacaine at sort of 10 to 20 mils an hour, depending on the size of the patient. The surgeons put in intercostal blocks, and then we give them PCA morphine or fentanyl, um, just for a bit of extra analgesia. But really we find that they don't seem to use the PCA that much, but they find it sort of comforting to know that they've got the button to press should they need it. And then we add in regular paracetamol, which is surprisingly useful. So in summary, um, multimodal analgesia is, it's a vital part really of any enhanced recovery process. The aim of it is to minimize the side effects whilst providing you know, adequate pain relief. And we find that the combination of paravertebral infusion, opiate PCA and intrathecal morphine works really well. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for the excellent and uh, very comprehensive presentation. I really, really enjoyed it. Now, if you don't mind, can I ask you one big question? And you don't, you don't have to have an answer, but I prefer if you have. From the point of view of our program in Norwich, and you, you, you've seen it comprehensively and you've seen so many patients, where can we do to improve um, our perioperative care uh, in terms of the analgesic uh, bits? Um, in, in, in terms of what we can do to improve that from an aesthetic point of view? Um, I don't know. I have my thought. One thing I've thought about is the erector spiny block that I mentioned in my talk, whether we could put a single shot erector spiny block in at the halfway stage as well before you go into the chest, because that in theory should give you your preemptive analgesia and pretty much numb the chest wall before you start, um, which could be helpful. Or you could put your paravertebral catheter in at the start of the chest phase rather than at the end of the chest phase. Because again, we could load the paravertebral up and run that all the way through the second stage. So that may be helpful in terms of preemptive analgesia. Um, other bits you could try, which may be just kind of playing around the edges. We don't really use gabapentin. We could try that. So there's a few of the things that we could look at and, and consider, but, you know, on the whole, you know, when you see the patients on HDU the next day, most of them are really comfortable and they don't need to use their PCA very much. So I think what we're doing is definitely working, there's a, but there's always room for improvement, I guess, in any program. Thank you very much for your excellent talk and excellent answers. Thank you. Um, Ed, can I ask more? one more question? Yes, yes please. Uh, Suzanne, please yeah. go ahead. Um, because we have some discussion sometimes with the anesthetist about the risks of um, uh, removing a uh, paravertebral catheter when you give anticoagulants. Uh, they, they are uh, classified as the same risk as an epidural. Uh, well, I think there's a much lower risk uh, for removal. I, I wonder what your opinion is um, about that. that is. So, uh, so I removed the paravertebral on the ward on day four, or day five, uh, before they go home. Uh, sometimes day six or seven, if, the, if they, they still need it, um, there is no, absolutely no uh, uh, risk comparable to the epidural. Uh, the reason for that is because it's in the subplural space next to the sympathetic nerve chain. Um, so um, I, I can't, um, I, I, I answer the same question every week with the, uh, with the pain team and all that when they come around. So it's, it's a very common question. I, I don't, I stop getting upset about it anymore. Thank you. I think, I think that, is there a problem with timing of, often it's about timing of um, doltaparin and anticoagulation and removing, and you, the risk should be lower with a paravertebral because a paravertebral hematoma, if you cause one, is going to cause a whole lot less problems than an epidural hematoma because there's just a lot more space. So I think the risks must be lower, but I don't know exactly what they are. Thank you very much. Over to you, Shiv. Thank you very much for all your uh, excellent talks.